Hey, I'm, I'm Tim Lorden um, with the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. Thank you for coming. Um, this is Growing Up at the Mobile Net Conference, uh, which is a pre-conference to the State of the Mobile Net, hosted by the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee. I'm the Executive Director of the Congressional Internet Caucus Advisory Committee, and on behalf of everybody, um, I wanted to say welcome, and also especially thank you to Common Sense Media for organizing our morning program on Growing Up at the Mobile Net Conference. So I, I, I got to say that kids and youth is an important aspect of this entire discussion. Uh, they are the true innovators, and we're thrilled that Alan, Todd, April, and everybody have put together this really great program for us this morning. So let me introduce your MC for the, this morning, April McLean Delaney. Um, April is a, a FCC attorney, worked for years for Conan Marks, um, worked for Laurel Space and Communications, even, even founded a company that launched, USAT, that launched satellites into space uh, for internet service. Um, <clears throat> she serves on the board of the Delaney Family Foundation, uh, and most importantly, she's on the board of Common Sense Media. She represents Common Sense Media with their regulatory and outreach efforts here in Washington, D.C., and she also serves on multiple uh, other set of boards, including the Georgetown Law Center. Um, so one of uh, April's most impressive uh, qualifications is that she's the mother of four daughters living here in Washington, D.C., and was able to get here today after, after multiple school drop-offs. So <laughs> April, welcome, and thank you so much. Welcome, and, and thank you all for coming, because I think it's a really important issue. Um, I am April McLean Delaney, and I am the mother of four daughters, ages 17 to 2. And I do um, ride, as I say, this, uh, this uh, uh, digital highway every day with my kids. Um, I, am a, I do outreach and education efforts here in Washington, D.C. And it always strikes me. Uh, yesterday I was at St. Albans, for instance, and I had so many parents come up to me about the texting and the sexting and the cyberbullying and all of the different things that happen. But they said, you know, how do we handle it? How do we, how do we have this role in, our, in, in society and, and in helping these kids? And I said, you know, it's, it's, you know it's, you're still parents. You're the primary role in, in making sure that the kids manage this media. But it's also educators policymakers and business leaders that come together to have dialogues like this. And I, I think this is the first step in a really um, long dialogue, but a very important dialogue in how um, uh, com uh, communications and media impact our kids. I have to commend um, Doug Lorton for doing um, this wonderful conference and focusing this um, pre-conference on kids and also um, Todd who's doing some yeoman's work and I would really commend that you all read this, do smart uh, phones equal smart kids. Uh, as we look at the dizzying array and of, of new co communication technologies, I was struck by a statistic I heard the other day. How many, and I almost throw it out to the audience, how many texts does the average teen send each month? Does anyone know? Raise your hand, raise your hand. 2,200 per month, which is 80 per day. And if you look at that, and you look at the 45 hours per week that the average teen spends with media, we, uh, we say it is like the other parent. And so really it's um, imperative for us all to get engaged and involved and to understand the impact and I think this is the first um, step in so doing. And I commend um, this panel and the panel on education and on privacy issues and really to kind of study it and, and to take it forward and to continue the dialogue. So I look forward to today. I thank you all for coming. And um, please, if you have any questions or uh, further input, um, Todd Haken and Alan and I will be here all day and, and willing to talk with you. So thank you for coming. And um, I, I'll have Alan lead off with the show. Thank you. And good morning, everyone. I'm Alan Simpson from Common Sense Media. I'm just going to briefly introduce our panel and let, and we'll go ahead and get started. And I want to thank them and all of us for join, all of you for joining us. But we have Phyllis Marcus from the Federal Trade Commission, Baron Zoka from the uh, Progress and Freedom Foundation, and Amanda Lenhart from the Pew Internet and American Life Project, and one of her colleagues on their latest research, which came out yesterday, and you probably saw news of Rich Ling from IT University in Copenhagen. So I'll let you two start it off, because you have the news. So um, Rich and I are going to tag team here and uh, talking about some of our latest findings. Um, we're going to kind of try to keep it brief. 
uh, since there's a wonderful panel here and we can have some great conversation. And uh, also, I think we really only, uh, the report that uh, Rich and I and our, our colleague Scott Campbell issued yesterday, uh, it's 94 scintillating pages and I think <laughs> it's, uh, it's a lot to cover in, a, in a one presentation. So um, we're happy to take any questions that you have uh, when this is all done and of course hope to talk about it during the course of the panel. Um, so uh, we're going to start off today just briefly to give you a background on, on how we did the research. Um, it's a, a study that we've, uh, you may have seen some other research that we released off of um, just uh, over the past uh, four or five months, but uh, it was, the data was collected uh, in September of 2009, the, uh, the telephone data at least, uh, and that was with 800 teens ages 12 to 17 and a parent or guardian. Um, that was, uh, the study was conducted on landlines and cell phones, which we figured was important given the topic of the study. Uh, we also conducted nine focus groups in four cities um, in June and October of 2009. Uh, with middle and high school students. And uh, I should also say, of course, that this is a joint project um, between uh, the Pew Internet Project and uh, the University of Michigan. Uh, and so uh, it's been great to collaborate on this. So I'm going to throw this particular slide to Rich, and we're just going to go back and forth. This slide is, um, actually, this contains some of the big news from the report. Uh, this, is, uh, this shows the percent of teens who say that they're in contact with friends on a daily basis over different types of mediation, different types of channels. And you can see, uh, for example, landline uh, is, is, you know, it's, it's hanging in there, but it's not really doing all that, that well. Social networking sites, uh, they get a lot of press, but they're, they're actually even a little bit lower than landline. Uh, call on cell phones uh, is, is relatively stable. Instant messaging, you know, there, there's some questions as to whether or not instant messaging is actually being taken over by social networking sites, because there's a lot of that functionality that's there. Email is just for nerds, nobody does that. Uh, and talking face to face, this is only talking face to face outside of school time. So it's a little bit different than the other variables here. But as you can see in the upper left hand corner there, text messaging uh, it goes from, in November 2006, from about 27% uh, who did that on a daily basis with friends up to about 54%. In other words, about half of the teens report that they're in contact with their friends by texting. And that's the real line that's trending upwards uh, in this data. And that, you know, that's one of the interesting surprises, or maybe not surprises, but one of the interesting facts that really came out of the data. Sure. And so uh, it's important just to contextualize this too, is 75% of American teens now have a cell phone. Um, of that group, 88% of them say they text. We now know that 54% of them are texting on a daily basis. Um, and I think one of the main findings of the report, and we're going to you know, continue to, to talk about it in, in more detail, is that the cell phone is really the hub of communications for teens today. As, as, these, uh, as these little mini charts show, um, text messaging is now overlaying on top of all these other ways that teens communicate. But the ways that teens communicate on a daily basis, their go-to choices are talking on their mobile phones, and talking via text. And those are the two real dominant ways that teens are now reaching out and, and interacting with their friends. Um, so just to give some demographic data about cell phone users, again, not that different than what we've seen in the past, evenly split between boys and girls. Um, younger teens are less likely to have a phone. Um, certainly lower income teens are also somewhat less likely to have a phone, though we'll see a little bit that those teens often have different practices uh, with their phones and different kinds of payment structures for their phones when they do have them. Um, we also see, um, actually, those numbers uh, around race and ethnicity also show no variation uh, in cell phone ownership, which is not something that we actually see with other kinds of technology. So the cell phone is actually much more democratic when it comes to, uh, it, to ownership than things like computers um, or, or other kinds of devices. Um, so, so numbers are getting thrown around about how many texts a teen sends a day. So our median data, so the middle number of teens, um, send 50 texts a day. Um, so that means half of teens send fewer and half of teens send more. Um, but when we really dive into that larger percentage, I'm sorry, the larger, the top 50%, uh, we find that it's 31% of teens are sending 100 messages or more a day, which is about 3,000 texts a month. And there's a 15% of teens, which is not in substantial number, it's about one in six, uh, who send more than 200 messages a day. Uh, and so that this is the kind of practice in which you would be sending so many text messages that often it overwhelms teens' phones. They have to clear out their inbox in order to be able to receive more messages because they've sent so many or received so many during the day. Um, so it's a really, a, a really quite important practice. 
uh, in teens' lives. But I think it's also really important to remember, I think, I think these numbers are shocking to people. Mm. They see the, these numbers and they think, oh, when do they do this? Because they're thinking like an adult, that, you know, oh, I might send one or two messages a day, I might send, actually adults on average send 10 messages in a 24-hour period, those adults that do send messages. Um, but uh, ultimately, uh, a text message, once you get to an unlimited plan, becomes like a conversation. Uh, and if you think about it more about as turns in a conversation, think about it more as instant messaging uh, than on a kind of a, a, a tiny email model, I think it makes more sense and these numbers seem less shocking. But if, if I can just shoot in just a little bit of sociology in there, you know, it's not like they're uh, agreeing on things or making functional types of things. It's, it's just sort of like, hi, how you doing? I just saw something going on. Uh, you know, just kind of uh, uh, another colleague of ours has called it a tap on the shoulder, just sort of saying, you know, I'm there. And so it, it, it's a way that they integrate their social interaction. When you think about teens' lives, it's that one period in life when you're not really in a, in a fam, you know, in a new, your, your friendship network is not really the woman or the man sitting across the breakfast table from you. It's, it's really distributed geographically. And so this is, you know, it, it, there's a certain logic in the sense that they're using this type of interaction for, for uh, carrying this out. And I think for many teens, while family is important, your parents are probably more uh, the most embarrassing people in your lives as opposed to the people that you want to be <laughs> communicating with all the time. And so I think that speaks to Rich's point about, um, about that your friendship network is that, is that network of urgency and, and the, the network that you really want to be communicating with. Um, and so in contrast with that, um, teens are not actually making that many calls. Um, they're making between one and five calls a day in general. Um, and again, that I think it's also important to remember that, that I think this is a point that Rich has made that um, calls can hold a lot more information than a text message can. And um, we even have a quote in our focus, from one of our focus groups where a teen says, you know, you can have a two-hour exchange on text messaging, and then when you're done, you realize you could have just had a 10-minute phone conversation to do the same thing. But, but that, you know, there's a positive and a negative side to that. Calling your parents, for example, when you're in the movie theater and saying, you know, can I go to the movies? You know, they kind of figured out what's going on. So texting can be a, a sort of a nice way to... Mm, not give information to. Yeah, exactly. Um, so one of the things that we found in the study that I think is particularly relevant to the group here today is we found that the kind of plan you have makes a big difference in how you use your phone. Um, so that typical teen is on a family plan with a limited minutes. That's about a third of all teens have those kinds of plans. Um, but it's important to note that there's a bunch of teens down here who have uh, pay-as-you-go plans. Um, which, can, uh, which often have unlimited uh, data, text, and voice, which, um, which we really find is actually an, really an important part of this as well, that having unlimited something on your phone, whether it's unlimited voice minutes, unlimited text, or unlimited data, changes your relationship to that function on your phone. Um, and we see it particularly with unlimited texting. Uh, one of the reasons we think that texting is so high now is that unlimited texting kind of came on the, to the scene a couple of years ago. And because in this country we pay to both receive and send text messages, as soon as your best friend gets an unlimited text messaging plan, suddenly she's not metering in her mind the text that she's sending to you, and yet you're still paying for each individual text. So while for her sending more text is not a kind of a, an additional marginal cost, it is much more for um, the users who are on the receiving end. And that basically pushes family as after they get one gigantic phone bill when you know Susie's best friend just got unlimited texting, they themselves then move over to unlimited texting and then send out texts in an unmetered way and then force their friend networks to get the same thing. So I think that's also what's at work here. Um, we also found that um, teens, who have, um, teens who have plans uh, where they are less supervised by their parents. In general, where they pay for the plan, where they have prepaid plans that are um, paid for either in part or in whole by the teen, um, those kinds of teens engage in a broader variety of activities on their phone, um, and they also are more likely to engage in some of the more negative activities on their phone, things like they're more likely to send a sext. Um, they are sometimes more likely to engage in some of the more dangerous driving practices. So it, it, there is something to there is something that we're still, I think, in the process of fully teasing out around um, the kind of plan that you have and the kind of relationship that means then that your phone has to your family and your parents, whether or not they're supervising it, they're paying for it, they're seeing the bill or not, and then how you as a teen choose to use that plan. But we have to really be careful here because we don't have causality. We don't know what's causing what. 
Uh, and obviously it's a very complex yeah. thing, but this we're, we're just seeing that correlation. Yeah, you know? exactly. You could have a bad relationship with your parents and therefore you went off and got your own phone as opposed to, um, you know, the, the opposite. Now, this one is uh, talking about parental regulation. And there are, there are two interesting things here, just to walk you through it a little bit. The gray thing is the total number. That's the total sample. With the, the uh, numbers on the top. The yeah. dark blue is for... Uh, no, no, wait, yeah. I'm sorry, this, one? yeah, it was the next this yeah, one. Yeah, this one, I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, the gray one's all teens. The dark blue is uh, boys, and the gray, the, uh, if I can use the arrow thing, there's girls. Here's the younger teens and here's the older teens. This dark blue at the bottom here is, is, is uh, older teens. And you can see in terms of parental regulation, consistently the girls are more regulated than the guys. Uh, through all of these different measures that we have, taking your phone away, limiting the number, uh, location-based, limiting time, all of those things, it's, it's generally the girls who are more regulated than the guys. And so what you're seeing here is just kind of a, re a reflection of the way parents deal with the, the gender of, of, their ch uh, of their children. The other thing you, s you see, and I think this is a very, very important message actually, is that the older they are, the less they're regulated. And so, again, this plays into that thing of, you know, adolescence, you know, I've talked about we want to give them the ballast that they need out in life. And the younger kids, we don't trust them as much. They get a little bit older. You, maybe you can trust them and, and so on. And you see this working through in these, in, in these statistics that the older teens are less and less regulated and perhaps their parents are, are not as, you know, maybe not as concerned, but they're just not as active in, in, uh, that, in, in these different dimensions of their lives. And so you see the way these things are just playing, the, the parental concerns and the approach to parenting are playing through in the way that they uh, set, up these, uh, set up the telephone for the kids. And uh, I mean, one of the other things too, to, just to, to, to back up a little bit, is that when we did this study, we wanted to try to understand what parents were doing in relation to their child's phone. What was a parent's approach to the phone? Were they taking steps to monitor, to regulate, to limit the child's phone or not? And then what was the impact of that on some of the child's behaviors? And we found that the most popular, the things parents are most likely to do is to check the contents of their child's phone and to take the phone away as punishment. Though again, we heard in our focus groups that we're taking the phone away as punishment often backfired because then the parents couldn't reach a child when they needed to. So that's, uh, I think, a less, an increasingly less popular option option because of the way the phone is so important in the family lives. Another thing in terms of going through the child's phone, now I'm going to sort of put on my uh, Scandinavian hat a little bit because that discussion has been uh, part of the discussion in, in Norway that where I'm most familiar. And the authorities there say unless you have a real good reason to, mi to mistrust your child about something, you know, you're really digging into their lives. You're really illustrating a mistrust with that child if you're going through their phone <coughs> log. I know that, you know, the U.S. is a completely different scene, but that Scandinavian approach would be that's sacred territory, that's as, as, uh, as sacred as their, their pocketbook or their purse, that in, unless you really have a, a good cause, you, that, that's theirs. But I know that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to another, uh, I'm, I'm talking in America right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and Rich is from Colorado, no. so just. Yeah. <laughs> um, but um, the other thing, one of the other things just to follow up on these, on these numbers is uh, the previous slides shows yep. that, um, that in fact actually African American and Hispanic parents, and this is English speaking Hispanics, and I actually, just a quick aside, uh, our colleagues at the Pew Hispanic Center um, are releasing data next week on Latinos and cell phone use and Latinos and computer use that looks at, at Latinos 16 to 25. Uh, and that's asking similar questions than that what we've asked on this survey um, about that. And I think there's some really fascinating data there, so I, I commend that to you all. Um, but African American and, uh, and uh, Hispanic parents are more likely to regulate their parents, uh, regulate their children's phone uh, more rigorously um, than white parents are. Um, but the other thing to take away from this particular finding in our study is that Alas, precious few of these activities actually seem to have any kind of correlation to uh, a lower level of uh, sort of what we might call negative cell phone related activities in a child's life. And that could be anything from being harassed on the phone to um, getting spam, to regretting a text you send, to sending a sexually suggestive text, to uh, engaging in or experiencing uh, dangerous practices behind the wheel. 
Um, and so the only thing that really did make a difference was when parents said that they limited a child's text messaging, um, that therefore there were lower levels of text-related negative behaviors. So lower levels of sending sexts, lower levels of uh, texting b behind the wheel and experiencing somebody texting behind the wheel in a dangerous manner as a passenger. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's, again, we have no causality there. We don't know which way the direction goes, but that's the only place where we saw even a correlation. So, uh, winding down, the other thing we wanted to look at, which we thought would be of interest, is the ways in which schools approach cell phones. Um, as, and, and in general, the, the finding from the report is that schools are kind of a disruptive force. Uh, sorry, the cell phones are a disruptive force in schools. <laughs> schools, schools, not so disruptive. Either way. <laughs> not so disruptive. Um, and that, uh, and that most schools kind of take a middle ground approach. They, uh, they allow cell phones on campus. This is this bottom section of, this, uh, of the pie chart. They allow cell phones on campus, but not in class. Um, there's about a quarter of schools that totally forbid cell phones, and then another 12% that are very permissive and just allow cell phones at any time. Um, nevertheless, um, regardless of the kind of school you go to, um, about 48% of teens have their phone turned on in school every single day. Um, 31% say they send and receive texts in class every day. Um, only 36% say they never do that. Um, ma sending, making or receiving calls in class is much less likely. Only about 4% say that happens to them frequently. 75% say they never do it. Um, but texting is clearly something that's going on in class. So then we wanted to find out if what, you know, whether the regulation style of the school made any difference in whether or not teens were sending texts. And the answer is no. Um, so if you see on the far side uh, of the chart, 58% uh, of teens who go to schools that, are, um, that forbid the phone completely have sent a text message in class. 65% uh, of teens who go to the middle ground schools have done it, and 71% of the teens where it's kind of a free flow uh, have sent it. And so uh, not much of a difference there, um, unfortunately, for people who are interested in managing the phones in schools. Just a quick anecdote. With our focus groups, we were sitting at, in one focus group, and I was, Amanda was actually sitting here, and there was a girl sitting here, and I'm, even during our focus group, she was uh, sending and receiving texts, and we went around the table, you know, it was fun to do, uh, ask these embarrassing questions. Uh, you know, all of them were, uh, you know, figuring out what they were going to do afterwards, talking with friends, sort of updating themselves. So yeah. it's, it's, it's so, a common part of life. So even, even in our focus groups where we had asked them to, you know, pay attention to a bunch of questions we were going to ask them, they were texting. It kind of went from focus group to participant observation. Yeah. You know? yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, oh, that's nice. Well, I think that's the end of our presentation. Thank you very much, and we look forward to taking your questions. Thanks. The slides are telling you you're done. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you both, and I, and I, I want to get through a little bit of dialogue and definitely open up for, we'll leave plenty of time for questions, but I also want to just, when we first started talking about this panel, and then we're doing the second one more about mobile phones and education, the privacy concerns around mobile devices in one way sort of come down to sort of two baseline questions with a lot more detail beyond that. And one of them is really whether parents and kids feel the same way about privacy. There have been some interesting studies lately about how they feel about privacy, whether there is a difference. Another one of the big questions, though, is whether parents and ki or kids have enough information about their privacy and about their use of phones and how it's impacting it. So I want to kind of dig into both of those, but also give uh, Baron and Phyllis each a chance to weigh in on what we've just heard from Pew and what we know about what kids and parents feel about privacy. As we were discussing before we started, there's a lot of unknown here in that first question. We don't, there are some studies, but they look more at older kids and not in kind of the 18 to 24 set, but I want to open it up to you guys first. Well, uh, I want to commend Amanda. Her, her work on this is really excellent, and uh, it, it really is quite a fascinating report, so I encourage you all to, to read it very carefully. And I will say in particular that it's the first time, I'm, I'm 29, and uh, so as I approach my 30th birthday, I sort of pride myself on, uh, on being hip about technology. And because I do technology policy, I, I sort of live under the illusion that I will always be an early adopter. <laughs> and yet, reading this, this study was literally the first time that I've ever thought to myself, Wow, I, I, I'm, I'm getting old. I These kids are crazy. I, I don't really get it. And, and what I mean by that is I, uh, even I struggle to really relate to uh, the, the sheer degree of mobility that, uh, 
that users have. And, and in particular, what's striking about the study to me is that it really is uh, almost all about texting, uh, which is very strange to me. I'm, I'm a compulsive mobile device user, but I mainly use the device to get on the internet. I, I email and I instant message. And kids don't do those things. And I'm, I'm really fascinated by that. Yeah. So um, if, if we could just take a moment for us to ask questions, if you don't mind. Yes. I really like, uh, the, the main question that leapt to my mind, Amanda, was I, if I recall correctly from the study, it's uh, something like a quarter of kids who have uh, cell phones have full internet access. And, and of those, it looks like you know, many, many, if not the vast majority of those, uh, do use uh, IM and social networking sites. Um, but I'm, I'm, I'm curious to, to hear your thoughts on why it, this is so much about texting. Is it just the, the cost of the data plan? How do you expect that to change in the future? Uh, that's a great question. And, and actually, when in our focus groups, we really dug down into that, and it's the cost. Um, when we asked teens why they didn't use um, instant message, why they didn't use internet-based apps and why they didn't go online on their phone. They said, you know, I, I wanted to, but my mom said it was too expensive and we turned it off on my phone. Um, you know, it would be fun, but I can't afford it. And it was more kids who were on these prepaid um, kind of what I would call all-you-can-eat plans that are now being offered by some of the lower-cost companies like Boost um, and Cricket that allow you to, for a flat fee in the month, for the month, have uh, unlimited voice, text, and, and data. And so those are the kids who seem to be more likely to use it. Then there's the separate contract kids who are actually mostly on, I, I, from what I can tell, they're mostly on iPhones or higher end phones that are not supported by their parents' family plans. And those are the kids who are also a bit more likely uh, to use those um, higher end phones. But, but most kids did not have iPhones or app-based phones yet. They really wanted them, but it was very, it was aspirational. So we had, we had one child in one focus group who had it, and he was like, you know, suddenly the elevated Rex. to this level of reverence by the group. <laughs> Wow, where'd you get that? Um, a lot of teens had eye touches, which um, was more appealing to families because they could lay out the initial cash for the device, but then didn't have the recurring cost of the airtime. They could just the, the child would use it to go would use it to go online at school um, through the Wi-Fi network at school, or use it to go on a, on a family Wi-Fi uh, or other sort of uh, widely available uh, Wi-Fi's. But in general, I think they, they weren't using it. Um, go ahead, Richard. If I could just comment, that two things. One. Uh, I think you know the iPhone has a tremendous presence in our minds, mm -hmm. uh, but if you start looking at the numbers, there are not that many around. I did a, I, I looked at the the number of iPhones on the net in Norway. Four percent of subscribers have an iPhone, mm -hmm. and and this is Norway. They've got enough oil to to kill anybody. Yeah. Uh, they're things. one of the richest countries in the world. Four percent had iPhones, and maybe another three or four had an HTC or something like that. So you know, it, it has a tremendous presence in our in our mind, but it, it's it's there are not that many out there. The vast majority of people, in, in fact, at that same time, the most popular phone in Norway was the Nokia 3510, which isn't even produced anymore. So there's a lot of old clunky phones out there that people are, are using, and it's good to remember those things. The other thing about texting is that, you know, we're sort of talking about individual uh, agency all the time, but you have to think of texting as part of kind of the, um, the ambient discussion or the ambient form of communication among teens, and that's where it's happening. And so if I text to Amanda, she'll text back. And we have this thing going on in our group of, you know, that's where we're deciding we're going to have the beer, that's where we're deciding where to meet, just sort of exchanging information. If I want go over to IM or if I go over to some other form of communications, I'm sort of out of the stream in a sense. But is, is that simply a matter of network effects? Is it simply the fact that texting is so ubiquitous yeah. that I know all my friends have it? Yeah. Ab yeah. Absolutely. There's an expectation that all of your friends have it and now you have interoperability and you can text to everybody. Whereas on IM, you all have to be online. You have to be at the desktop at the same time. You have to use the same program. Um, it, text messaging is much more seamless. And I think text messaging is also a constant available. You always have it. it it's, it's addressed to an individual, a single person. You know, this is my phone. Nobody else is going to answer it. So unlike calling a landline, for instance, or even uh, calling is a little bit different, but calling a landline, you might get somebody's dad. And maybe you don't want to talk to them. If you want to talk directly to a person, you can text. Text also has a bunch of affordances, I think, that make it more useful in the lives of teens. Teens spend a lot of time in school and in places where it is not appropriate to make a voice call or to even converse openly but, uh, through, with your voice. Um, but a text message can serve like, as, a, as a digital note. 
Um, mm -hmm. It gets passed silently. It can be um, sent and received. It can wait for the person to receive it if the person doesn't happen to be available at that time. But it can also serve as a conversation. So it's functionality in the lives of teens, um, in the ways in which it allows them to have private sort of back channel conversations, mm -hmm. is also, I think, a part of what's driving youth. Um, one anecdote and then a question, yeah. Amanda. I was recently out to dinner and there was a group of what I think was about 14-year-old girls. There were about 10 of them at a birthday party. And clearly this was a tight social network. But as the girls got up to talk to others around this large table, they had their phones almost as if they were Velcroed to their hands. They held them just like you held your Blackberry. And they moved around the table with their phone I assume that some of the people who were texting them were sitting around that table. So they check their phone and then talk and then check their phone and then talk. I mean, it was almost something like out of Avatar. You know, this was, this became part of the hand. Um, I know that most of what you do, if not all of your research, is focused on teens, age 12 to 17. Um, have you done any work with younger kids, age 2 to 11? Um, and where are those, the trends moving with the younger kids? So we haven't done work with eight kids that age. Um, we have thought about it and considered it and hope at some point maybe to, to go into that realm, but in, in general it adds an additional layer of complication. Um, a lot of research on kids in that age, particularly six and younger, is with the parents, not with the child, and we tend to be focused on bringing child voices into the conversation mm -hmm. in ways that they're often not. Um, so uh, we haven't looked at that. Um, uh, in terms of who is, uh, I, I don't know. There are some. Sonia Livingston. Sonia, Sonia Livingston is, is doing a piece in Europe where she's going as young as eight, she's going eight to sixteen or nine to sixteen, and she will ask about cell phones and a bunch of um, a bunch of kind of hair raising practices around cell phones and internet use, um, and that's going to come out in the next couple of years. Okay. Um, it's actually a twenty-two country study. It's astonishing. Um, I can't wait to see the data. So, um, but that's in process. But beyond that, I don't I don't know of, of U.S.-based studies that are looking specifically at kids that age. And then teasing out your age data a little, um, I can't recall whether you said on your slides that you see kind of a gradation in practices, that the children at, at age 12 have more limited functionalities on their phones, and then by age 17, their, their phones are kind of wide open to a variety of uses. Is that right? Wider. Open. Wider. Yeah. I think is the way to put that. I would assume that you know a parent who's going to grant a child a cell phone at a younger age is going to be more interested in some of the controls you can put on the phone and then open them up over time. If I could just call, one of the things, you know, and I, I can't read a comment on the U.S. team, but the thing that I see in, in Norway is that for the youngest kids, it, it's almost turned to uh, the convenience of the parent. You know, I, uh, call me when you're done with your soccer practice, and I'll come and pick you up. Mm -hmm. You know, it's it's that kind of thing that's going on. And their social life, if you think about kids in that age, is is really geographically tight. Yes. Uh, and so, and, and the kids are pretty bad with phones too. Yes. You know, they lose some water on them. You know, they're they're pretty <laughs> perishable items. Uh, and so, th there's it, there's a different thing going on. But after they move up into junior high, or middle school, I guess, and, and high school, you know, it, it takes on that social dimension, particularly yeah. among, girls. among girls. And so it, it, there's a different spin on things uh, as things progress. So one of the things that we saw in the data when looking at the, at the different age ranges is that there's a, a subset of kids who I would call emergency phone users, which is what Rich is talking about. And these are the kids who make almost no calls, who t send almost no texts. Um, and who essentially don't really use their phone at all. Um, and they're predominantly 12 and 13 year old boys who have not been yet swept is sort of uh, into the social scene in the ways that girls in that age group have. Um, and for them, and there's still, there's kids in all groups and all, of all genders who fall into this category, um, but for those teens, the phone is really about convenience. It's exactly for parents. It's about connecting with my family on a logistic level. It's when I'm in trouble and I need to reach out for help. That's the only reason that they have it. Um, you know, we even had a teen in a focus group who basically talked about how he had a hard time remembering to keep it charged because it just wasn't an important part of his life. And this is a middle schooler, um, whereas older teens can't imagine turning their phones off. So I think there's, there's, really, a, there's really a spectrum. Um, older teenage girls, 14 to 17, are the heaviest users of the phone in all way, almost all ways, um, particularly through text messaging. They average, average 
the mean is 100 texts a day, average is 134 texts a day for girls in that age group. Um, in our focus groups, we heard a number of girls, as I mentioned, talk about having to clear out their inboxes two and three times a day in order to allow new messages to come in. So for the, that group, the phone is really this, it is literally an appendage. It is, as you talked about, it, you, it, would, just, it would not leave your phone. It sleeps in your hand next to your pillow, and it, it, it stays with you all the time. But another, one other quick dimension on this, we did a thing a few years ago where we looked at divorce, children in divorce situations as opposed to so-called intact families. You know, it's a really messy definition, but we had to, we cleaned it up a little bit and we compared that. And it turns out the kids that are in uh, divorce situations, just to be blunt about it, uh, got their phones earlier. Yeah. And it's just a coordination thing, you know. You're going to spend the weekend with your dad. Well, wear your soccer shoes, and you know I want to make sure. And when is he going to pick you up? And you know all of these kinds of things. And the other thing that it does is it gives the non-resident parent a direct channel to the kid. In other words, having to go, <laughs> having to go through the ex to talk to the kid can be a problem. So you know usually the non-resident parent, in, in our study at any rate, was a little bit of an advocate about giving the kid a phone just so they had kind of a direct channel to them. So it, just to tie this back to the, the, the privacy topic, uh, when I read through the report, the big question looming in my mind was, at, at what point is this generation going to start up, upgrading to more sophisticated devices, right? At what point is that is that tipping point going to occur? Because I, I think you probably put your finger on it that it is about network effects and the cost of adoption. So we, what trends do you see? Uh, is, it, is it a matter of the service plans becoming cheaper? Uh, is it the devices because parents are, are concerned about buying something that costs $200 that their kids are probably going to drop and break? And it's, it's all of those things. It's absolutely all of those things. It is, it's the cost of the plans getting cheaper. It's as unlimited plans become cheaper and become more normative. I think that is changing people's relationships to the phone. As the devices themselves become cheaper and I would say more durable, but they're not becoming more durable. But as they become cheaper and, and in some ways more disposable. Um, but it, what we see a lot is actually a pass down phenomenon. A l number of teens they don't get to buy their phone. Mom and dad passes down dad's one-year-old phone that's, you know, he's up for a recontract, so he gets a new fancy phone and you get dad's old phone. So I, kids do still tend to lag behind, and, and that's not to say that there's not a huge, particularly among boys, aspirational element of phones. I mean, every single boy in every male focus group that we conducted could tell you the exact specs of his phone. I mean, down to the, oh yeah, it has this mount memory, and it's this, it's an LG 3B, and it's, it does this, and has a keyboard, and it has the, and we, I would ask, we would ask girls, and they would say, uh, I have a, it's, a, it's a phone, it's a stick phone, it has a keyboard, I can talk on it, but they had no idea what the phone was or the specs of the phone. So there certainly is that element that's driving teens towards fancier phones, but the data plan cost right now is still prohibitive for the vast majority of families, unless it gets bundled into these phones. But because families see, hey, I can put my child on my plan for $10 a month, that means we all have to share these minutes, and it means, but it's, it's the entry point. And families want to do that if they can possibly afford it. It's the families that can't afford that where the parents shift the cost of the phone entirely to the child who are the people who end up on the prepaid plans. Another, another bit there is that I don't think at the end of the day everybody is going to be a super user. In fact, I think the super users are going to be, you know, there's going to be always going to be sort of super duper users in terms of a lot of functionality, a lot of different things. But there's a big middle ground of people who just text and talk. Uh, if you look at a lot of the traffic information, that's what's happening. That's where, you know, that's where things are happening. It's clear, though, after I've said that, that there are new phones coming on, iPhones, there are smartphones, that, and that technology is kind of coming down and down and down in, into, the market, into the marketplace. But a lot of people base their lives basically on texting and talking, and that's good enough. So, so this is really important for the, the policy conversation, because if, if the world of today and the world even of five or ten years from now is primarily oriented towards texting, for all the reasons you've described, I mean, basically what I'm imagining when I, when I hear you is that even in ten years, even when data plans are substantially cheaper and devices are substantially cheaper, it might still be the case that even though more teens have a more sophisticated device and more teens are getting online, that the primary method might still be texting. So, and, and, and if that's true, I, I think it, it changes the privacy debate for the simple reason that the, the texting as a form of communication, it does raise concerns about what kids do. They may do embarrassing things. They may send embarrassing photos, and those may be serious concerns. But it's a different dimension of the, the wide internet. 
of all the things that kids can do on social networking sites and having that with them mobile. Well, but, well if, I, if I could just shoot in, yeah, I agree with that. But if you look at the example of South Africa, there's a thing called Mixit in South Africa mm -hmm. where it's, it's a web-based IM sort of thing. But I have to convince you to go on. If I want to talk to you, I convince you to go on to mix it. And once you've paid for that data plan, our interaction is free. Hmm. And so I convince you, and then you convince her, and you know, and we all convince one another. And pretty soon, there's a tipping point where everybody's on mix it, and nobody's on the, the uh, texting, traditional right. texting. And so that. But but the thing with mix it is it's a com it's a commercial thing. They're afraid of the authorities there. If there's political stuff going on, if there's stuff that will get them shut down, they'll censor it. So it's a, it's a completely different, you know, it's a different space uh, in, in the cyber world. What did your study find about, um, I guess, among teens who had access to the internet on their phones? Mm -hmm. Were they using it to engage in social networking um, in, in the way that that's traditionally known? Were they, had they downloaded the Facebook mobile app, for example, and were they updating their status? Through their phone. So that's, and actually that is the predominant use of, of, uh, of the phone. So email was a primary use. It really depended on what kind of phone the kids had. Many of the smartphone, of the kids who went online were using smartphones like Blackberries, which are email focused. And so those were the kids that were occasionally, they were using it to do email. They were using it to do uh, Blackberry text messaging. They were using, uh, they were using it to go online. Um, but one of the things that teens said, and this comes back to Baron's point, uh, Baron's question as well, is teens told us that this is going online through the cell phone is about convenience because it's a much slower experience still because we still have not built out the kind of network functionality that means that you have the same kind of speeds on your iPhone or on your Blackberry that you have uh, on a home computer. Um, we still don't have the small screen experience. Teens, many teens said, you know, I can check my social network on my Blackberry and I'll do it when I'm on the go or I can check it on my, my phone when I'm on the go. But it's much more fun to do it at home, and I'd much rather do it on my desktop computer. So the teens for whom this is really the most, that, that they're really some of the more intense users are the ones who have uh, more indifferent or less uh, seamless access at home. Either it's a, they have a home computer that is a dial-up, they have a home computer that is a very, it's a shared, heavily shared with a number of people in the home where they can't get online because, you know, my sister has to use it for homework, and then my dad's got to use it for work, and then somebody else has to use it, and I'm fifth in line. Those are the kids for whom the phone becomes the primary way or the best way to go online because it's the only way for them to go online easily and at the times when they want to go. Um, it's for going online on the go. But I still think because of the limitations of that way of going online that not as many teens are doing it and it's not, it, is, it has not reached the level of, uh, I think, uh, of, of enjoyment that they still get from, uh, from uh, desktop. I think the iPhone and the iPad and those types of, uh, of, of, uh, of handsets are moving in that direction and those are much more enjoyable and that's why they are something that teens want um, but we're not quite there yet in the teen realm. That's that's one of the things I think that's really interesting about this space. I mean we did a study about social networking a, a year ago and the numbers were similarly shocking and, and discordant for a lot of parents because it's like we don't go on social networking sites. Mm -hmm. Kids go a lot mm -hmm. but part of we didn't have enough time to dig deeper on that but part of the reason might be Kids use social networking sites the same as you've described. That's their one of their email sources yes. or mm -hmm. something instead of email. Yes. Mm -hmm. And in this same way, you're right that they're they don't have the smartphones yet. Mm -hmm. Their devices are smarter than a lot of parents realize. Mm -hmm. Their devices are getting smarter. Mm -hmm. Their plans are getting cheaper. Mm -hmm. And I watch I watch a lot of people who do have smartphones and they're using it for social networking. Mm -hmm. And I think your point about their better connections at home are, is, a, is a dominating factor right now. But I think most parents, that often a lot of the parents we deal with, look at the other concern, which is once it gets a little easier, the advantage to my mobile device is also that mom's not, I'm not in the living room. You know, I can now do this from anywhere, mm -hmm. stay connected, and maybe not have as many, somebody looking over my shoulder quite as much as they do with a with a home-based computer. Yeah, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, that's certainly part of what's going on, and it, that's also part of why we see it's again these teens on prepaid plans, teens who pay for their own plan, yeah. teens who are on separate contracts, where they are. Those are the ones who are are using the internet more, and a part of that has to do with those are kids who are engaging in a lot of other 
different kinds of practices, both practices that I think don't raise any eyebrows, like sending more videos, but also practices that do, like sending nude images of themselves. And so I think certainly there is something about it being um, sort of outside of parental supervision. Yeah. That said, we heard a lot of teens in our focus group talk about the ways in which, yeah, they knew their parents were going through their phone. And right. for younger teens, right. it was a deterrent. And for older teens, they're like, I just put the naked pictures in the password protected part of my phone. My mom doesn't know the password. Right. So there's still this element of um, that it is a personal device that teens control, even when it is on mm. a family plan, and that um, it's a space that is less less parentally monitored um, than others, and that's very appealing. Let me keep this on the privacy for one more, and then I want to open it up to the audience, but the primary policy tool in terms of kids' privacy, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, is really a, most about giving parents more information and more ability to manage what's going on with their kids' information, Let, letting them be obviously the primary manager of this situation. How much of this, obviously that was, that, that was written in 1998, not, these mobile devices were not really a factor, the internet itself was, was, has, has come light years since then. Do parents have the information they need? Did you, have you seen in any of these studies, do, I mean, do kids know what sort of information they're giving out with these devices or could give out with these devices? But even, maybe even more importantly, we've heard a great deal from parents who don't seem aware what kids can do with all these devices. The iTouch is a great example. It's like, I got my kid an iTouch because it's not a phone. Well, it is a text device. It is, it, it's capable of doing many other things. Do you know either from your research or for, from what you've seen in other studies, is there enough information out there for parents to help them manage this? Um, you know, I think that, you know, that's a, that's a great question. It's not one that our report does a great job of answering. Um, you know, what we know is, we know what parents think they, they, we know what parents tell us that they do in relation to the phone, but we don't necessarily know what that means about parents' understanding about what their children are actually right. doing mm -hmm. with the phone. Right. We only know what the steps parents believe that they either need to tell us that they take or that they actually take yeah. um, to try to monitor. And we, we hear about some of the places in which there's, there's certainly conflict over that. So one question where we did have um, sort of both sides is we asked parents whether or not they monitor their child using their cell phone, uh, monitor their child's location using their cell phone. And I should be very upfront that that question can be interpreted two ways by parents. It could either mean that I call you up and I specifically ask you and say, where are you? Or I've enabled some kind of GPS um, application on the phone and we don't know which is which. Um, and then we also asked teens, do your parents monitor your location through your phone? And in general, there was pretty good overlap there in which parent, mm -hmm. teens said, yep, my parents are monitoring me, and the parents say, yeah, I'm monitoring. There's, there's a lot of, uh, a, a lot of, uh, of uh, overlap. But we didn't, go, we didn't go beyond that and ask, you know, to parents, are your children doing X on the phone, and then asking the children whether or not they did that thing. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, our, our sense is, is that parents don't have a lot of, of great information about it. I mean, certainly, I you know, COPA with two, COPA with two P's applies to children, I believe, 13 and younger or under 13, and that is predominantly children not in our study. So, um, you know, what information parents have about how their 12-year-old is using their cell phone is is not something that we really have right. a great sense of. Right. Um, we are, are currently uh, reviewing the Children's Online Privacy Protection Rule that the Commission promulgated pursuant to the Act. And um, it's going to be probably at least a year-long effort. Um, and we have posed a pretty extensive series of questions to the entire public. And um, some of the questions get at this issue. I mean, right up front, we've asked whether there is a continuing need for our role as it currently exists, and whether some modifications might be warranted. And we also ask what effect, if any, the rule has had on children and parents and other consumers. Implicit within that question is what awareness there is out there of the rule. Um, and then we've drilled down into certain areas and asked specifically whether parents know of their right to review and have deleted children's information when the children have provided it to website operators. It doesn't quite answer your question, Alan, but we are looking around the boundaries of COPPA to determine if, whether there's any research out there yep. on parental adoption, at least of COPPA as it is currently mm -hmm. drafted. 
Very I, I look forward to seeing what, what comes out of this um, this uh, review and, and the rulemaking, uh, excuse me, the, the roundtable that's going to be on uh, June 2nd. Uh, because there are a lot of interesting questions, and I think the FTC has done a great job at, at asking about the, the trade-offs that are involved, uh, what the effects have been on small operators and small businesses, but also understanding, and it, when, when you read this, you really understand that, that COPPA, you know, it's rare that we, we at the Progress and Freedom Foundation find a statute that we, we like. <laughs> Um, but but, the, but, but I, and there are really good things to be said about COPPA, and, and the best of them is that it's a very subtle statute, that the intent of COPPA is really about getting in parents uh, involved and making sure that they are um, participating in, in the process here. And so, you know, one way to do that is the, the ways that, uh, that COPPA uh, has the tools of, of verifiable parental consent. But, but another way, and, and not necessarily exclusive of COPPA, but working in conjunction with COPPA to the extent that applies, and then also for older teens, is the power of the purse. Uh, and this is something we at, at PFF, Adam Thier and I have talked a lot about. And it's, it's an interesting story that is really um, important in, I, I think, your study. So you know, if one reads the study with, with an understanding of the debates that have happened about parental controls, and if we recall back to uh, COPA with 1P, the Children's Online Protection Act. Uh, you know, the debate in that case was basically about um, are, are, are parents going to be involved and do, um, do the tools that are available to parents have to be perfect to be preferable to regulation? And the court said no. In a nutshell, the court said that, that, that parents um, having tools uh, and being educated to make uh, informed decisions about what their children consume, uh, even if that doesn't happen perfectly, is preferable to regulation. And so what we at PFF have done is, has been to try to talk about those less restrictive alternatives to regulation, first and foremost, education uh, and empowerment. And so I, I'm, you know, I'm fascinated in reading the study to know where are the areas where we need to do more education. And that's an, an area where I hope that the, the FTC will do the, the kind of great work that it's done in the past on, on helping to educate both kids and parents and also teachers and educators about how to use the tools responsibly, whether they're texting or the internet or, or, or whatever else. But, but also, it's, it's the analogies to parental control tools. So the great thing about the, the desktop space is that there are many tools available. It's not right. just a one-size-fits-all, you know, kids, uh, parents get to either turn it off or turn it on. But they, they, can, they have all sorts of ways of controlling uh, what their kids do. And there are different tools for different parents and different tools for kids of different ages. So one of the things I'm really curious about in reading the report is the extent to which you see that, that diversity of tools developing. Uh, and for example, you, you mentioned that some parents maybe feel uncomfortable about reading the, the texts or the messages that their kids are sending. And, and you know, we who champion technological empowerment would love to see develop tools where maybe parents don't have to do that, but they could see which numbers their kids are sending messages to or they could uh, potentially block a certain number. So if you know that your kid you know, really shouldn't be talking to a particular person, you can just blacklist that particular number. So are we seeing those sorts of tools develop? Well, you know, I think what's interesting about this environment, and you know, I'm thinking back to sort of the early days of the internet and wondering how much it, it actually is similar. But because cell phones uh, in this country are the devices, we, we are so um, sort of pr service provider focused, most of the parental controls that we see being developed are coming in on the service provider level. And that's something that happens um, in some ways independent of the phone that you have. Now, I, I, I'm not 100%, I'm not this is something that we looked at a couple of months ago, and I'm not 100% certain about what, what there are in terms of device level um, controls that are available. But most of the things that I'm aware of that exist now are things that are offered by service providers uh, generally at an additional cost to parents um, that allow them to set up various ways of uh, monitoring phones. And there are ways to block phone numbers. There are ways to, there aren't such great ways right now to, to limit uh, things related to text messaging, but, but that may be changing right now. The ways I see is the toggle between sending oh, yeah. texts that are texts and texts that are pictures. Um, it's easier to turn off picture messaging, partly because it's generally more expensive, so parents have been turning that off. Um, and some parents who are concerned about sexting have taken steps to turn off uh, picture messaging as well while still allowing their child access to text messaging. Um, but uh, it's really piecemeal at the moment. The different service providers offer very, very different things. Um, and uh, it, it can be, it, there are different levels of different plans and it, it, it's, it's a lot to wade through if you're, if you're trying to understand kind of the comprehensive picture of, of what's going on. So, uh, you know, I think certainly 
um, these things are offered in general by most uh, by most service providers because they know that parents want it and these are things that they're, they're not necessarily they're things mostly that regulate the phone use as a phone not so much regulating the phone as an internet device and that's I think the place where we need to, to start moving forward right and there's a it's a rapidly changing space I want to open it up and I think we've got the one microphone there and since we've got someone ready to go we'll start with the questions from the floor hi thank you I'm Julie Rones and I'm from the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee and I speak on a personal capacity and I applaud you for the study um, actually, um, it really doesn't surprise me, uh, but I, I applaud the capturing of the information. Uh, it just highlighted certain themes for me. Um, one, harnessing technology for education and productivity, um, privacy, partnerships, and emergency usage. Um, I just want to kind of throw out a hypothetical, uh, basically. Um, I was wondering, what would the thought be if, for example, the uh, different companies, the providers got together and forged a public-private partnership in which educational uses were encouraged to capture and uh, enable the teams. For example, if they created a, a format where they had a subsidized or not even subsidized, but a plan that allowed for the uh, distribution of equipment and also for the use of messaging for a flat fee if the kids and the parents would accept educational approaches like the kid would have to maybe accept text on a daily basis is either math science or some kind of fact the educational fact i mean what you pointed out was that they're wasting a lot of time that could be used for educational purposes and they're hand holding they're not really doing a whole lot except checking on each other so if this could be used they're going to use it in school so why not recognize it one of the things that we found out for emergency usage in New York was that when H1N1 hit, that they had to use the phones to get in touch with the parents so that these kids could be picked up and be able to uh, keep in contact. And that was very instrumental for the school. And they recommended that these different policies be changed to recognize the need to get in touch with the kids by virtue of having cell phones. So if all kids can have cell phones, but if you can arrange it like France at one time distributed handsets for telecommunications to the residents because they recognize the need for productivity. If that could be done, if the companies would agree, and if they could set, um, if the parents would agree to accept, for example, privacy monitoring by creating algorithms within the plans like AOL did when they first established these uh, cable approaches, they could, uh, flag when something came out and stop it and shut it down before it happened if you know there was a threat of bullying language sexual um, language so I'm just wondering um, you know I'm just throwing that out there it seems as though if we're going to capture and drive things productivity using technology education and also being able to capture your emergency kinds of things if you need to flag um, uh, suicidal kinds of approaches. Um, it seems as the, the technology is there. If we can kind of tweak things to better uh, take advantage of its use. And if those kids who couldn't afford it, if you know, there could be an arrangement where if they agreed to accept this educational texting on a daily basis or something and taking tests or what have you, that seems like um, it would help not only the United States in terms of improving and harnessing the educational resources, but also being able to um, advance you know, things on different levels. So I was just throwing that out there for consideration. Thank you very yes. much. Yes, thank you. <laughs> I mean, just, just one thing to say is if you're interested in educational uses of the cell phone, I commend to you the Pockets of Potential report by the Joan Gantz Cooney Center. It came out last year. It was written by Carly Schuler, and it does a really nice job of surveying a bunch of different projects that are trying to harness, um, uh, trying to harness educational uses and really use cell phones in educational contexts. And I think that's a... Uh, that's certainly a, a place. Uh, the public health realm has also been quite um, active in trying to figure out ways to use um, text messaging to give people um, information that they want um, on particular topics, uh, sensitive topics like sexual health. 
Um, so certainly there are people who are moving in that direction. Uh, I'm Lucy Getman, National School Boards Association, and I'd be interested in hearing uh, examples of the ways that schools have been able to capture the transformative potential for learning that this technology represents, while at the same time, you know, balancing the need for student safety and positive school climate and that sort of thing. So are there elements of an ideal school policy or an education approach or a monitoring approach? Are there other elements that schools have successfully used to, to balance both the potential and the pitfalls? The, the education piece is something I think we'll talk a lot more about in the second panel, yeah. but you're also raising one of the tensions, I think, in this whole space, which is, will we be able to advance the educational and, and the, the beneficial potential of mobile devices, these mini computers that more and more kids are carrying around, when there are safety concerns about them and privacy concerns about them? Will, they, will that be something that deters wide use. And one of the things I know we'll, we'll dig into a little bit in the second panel is kind of the concerns that school administrators have about their networks and their obligations. Right, and I, this is just anecdotally. I think what might happen is that even if a school becomes more sophisticated in permitting uh, use of technology, if there is an incident involving that school system um, where children have misused the technology, even if it's localized, then I, th I believe that the reaction is to shut it all down. Yeah. And so there, there's not a lot of will right now to innovate when school systems are still trying to figure out their liability and their obligations and their relationships with law enforcement. Um, so we're, we're still in that kind of reactive panic phase, I fear. Okay. I'd, I'd also like to comment that um, I'm surprised, for example, that the mobile phone space hasn't been occupied or invaded, I don't know how I want to say this, by games. Uh, you don't see World of Warcraft. You don't see these, these PC-based or internet-based games going on too much on phones. There's a little bit of stuff going on, but that's really the PC world. And one of the things I think that that says to me, and, and you know, if you take that over into the educational realm, you know, the idea of, of um, distributed types of things going on on mobile phones, and there's a real powerful metaphor associated with mobile phones of its person-to-person -person interaction. I'm talking to you. You're talking to me. I'm going to talk to somebody else. This whole idea of the networked uh, aspect hasn't really come into the mobile world yet. There's, there's bits and pieces of it. iPhone does a bit of that. But, but you just don't see that. And so it's, it's almost like there's two separate worlds going on. And there's a little bit of flirting with each other on the, on the edge. But it, they haven't, in, in, if you'd see it any place, it'd be in the games. There'd yeah. be a world of Warcraft for mobile phones. Well, I, there I, isn't. I think you are starting to see that. And it will be very interesting. It's hard to parse it out completely. But with the number we found for our report is that uh, 2.3 billion downloads of apps in the last year. Mm -hmm. And a lot of those, not all, and it's hard to slice exactly, but a growing number of those apps for mobile devices are games. No. I certainly have talked to people in the, in the video game space who are sort of looking around at their business model and going, um, okay, this is all going mobile very quickly. Mm -hmm. And how much it will go interactive <coughs> will, will be a big driver as well. Yeah. Go ahead. Hi, thanks. Uh, Mark Schneiderman with the Software and Information Industry Association. Uh, a, a quick plug, actually. Uh, our, uh, we're a high-tech group that represents many uh, technology, software, digital content providers in education. Our conference next month in San Francisco is focused on mobile. We are bringing together the platform and hardware providers with the application and content providers to work through some of these opportunities around education and, and school formal education, especially. The question is around uh, COPPA. Uh, we touched on that a little bit. I wonder if the panel could go in a little bit more into what are some of the fundamental differences between a student having, a, a, not a student, a, a, a child under 13 having their own computer uh, that may be mobile if they, you know, at times, uh, versus a, uh, a, a, a cell phone or a smartphone in terms of why we need to relook at COPPA and what are some of the uh, technical uh, issues that, uh, t technical not just in a technology sense, but in a, in a policy and, 
and uh, monitoring sense that, that uh, come up and maybe directly to sure. FTC if possible. Okay. Um, well, there's, there's two answers, really. Um, in theory, perhaps there isn't much of a difference between a child holding a computer in her hand and having one in the home. And COPPA would apply to a ch child's access of the internet regardless of the device that she's accessing it on. Um, but in reality, there could be big differences um, depending on the way in which the child is communicating. COPPA applies to websites and online services that are routed through the internet. And actually, um, we have raised that very question in the rule review that is currently underway. That is, what are the applications uh, of COPPA to things like interactive gaming, interactive television, mobile communications? And we're, we're currently exploring the boundaries of COPPA. The FTC is limited in its jurisdiction. Um, we don't have jurisdiction over common carriers and communications, and so um, we have set out to determine whether COPPA needs to be modernized. We don't have those answers right now, but you've kind of laid out for us that one of the key questions that we will be looking at. Well, since we haven't really gotten to, to chat much about privacy, I'll, I'll just say again that um, I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of the, the COPPA review. Uh, deadline for comments is June 30th, and uh, Phyllis is having a, a roundtable on uh, June 2nd, which I think... You're doing great. Which will be, uh, I, I could go work for the FTC. <laughs> but, 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 but now, so now I'll, I'll put on my, my FTC, um, not, 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 not credit hat, but, but let me just say that there, there is a certain danger here, which is I, I think the folks that are currently administering COPPA have a deep appreciation of its limitations and the trade-offs involved. I, I am, however, concerned um, that there are there have been efforts at the state level to expand COPPA. Uh, my colleague Adam Thier and I put out a paper last year about COPPA 2.0, about efforts to take that model and expand it beyond the framework for which it was intended. And I, I don't necessarily think there's, or have any reason to think there's anybody at the FTC that wants to do that. But I, I am pretty confident that we'll see people in the, uh, the uh, review process who suggest expanding COPPA to cover adolescents, which is, uh, in fact, many people don't realize this, but it was originally, as introduced in Congress, would indeed have applied a, uh, a much less restrictive, but still uh, a set of regulations to access by adolescents 13 to 16, and those were removed because of concerns about uh, free speech rights and the trade-offs involved. Um, so I'm, I'm concerned we're gonna see that. I'm also particularly concerned, and I, I don't think this is intentional, that we are seeing uh, probably an unintentional intersection of, of two things. One is this review of COPPA, which may open the door to some of these <coughs> changes or even calls for changes in the act itself, which of course the FTC is, can't do and, and I'm sure isn't calling for. But there is an underway right now an effort to expand the FTC's general jurisdiction, its general, excuse me, its rulemaking authority and its, uh, and its enforcement powers. And that's in the financial services um, reform uh, uh, legislation that was passed in the House in the fall. And there was really no discussion about this. That legislation is now in the Senate. We had an event, uh, PFF Roundtable, on this last week. And the concern that we have is that that, that, that change, it's basically intended towards uh, financial frauds, could allow a future FTC to, under pressure when you know, we're sitting at this roundtable here in five years and we're dealing with a different set of facts, to take the COPPA model and start applying it to adolescents. Because at that point, as far as I can tell, the statute itself, if, if, that, if that change were to pass, the statute would become sort of irrelevant as a limitation. The FTC could, if it wanted to, start issuing uh, both more strict rules and rules that apply to, to children. So I want to be clear that I'm not suggesting that, that this FTC is doing that or even thinks that's a good idea. Uh, but that's certainly an issue that we're, we're facing. And it could change the way that this this space is regulated uh, pretty substantially in the future when we start moving towards those sorts of interactive devices that have more uh, internet capabilities that, that you know, Amanda and, and Rich were talking about. And our hope at PFF, again, in a nutshell, is that we give parents the tools to make decisions for themselves and you know, for their children, and we educate both, both parents and kids and, and instructors on how to use those things, and we basically trust that those parents will, will make good choices, and I think that the study actually kind of suggests that parents are pretty involved, that about you know, two-thirds of parents are actively engaged, and, and that's very different from a lot of the, the rhetoric that you hear in the parental controls debate, which often suggests that really only a tiny percentage of parents are active and involved, and so I, I take great comfort in that. I want to put on my 
PFF critic hat for just a moment, and not as much. It's, it's, a, much, it's a frequently worn hat. Exactly. <laughs> but to, to another part of that, and I want to make sure we have time for these last two questions, but I saw an op-ed the other day about digital due process, which is the a, a coalition working on the larger privacy issues, not just for kids, and it's Google and Microsoft and the ACLU and a and, number and of PFF. groups. And making a case that we should have more protections against the government accessing what should be private information, things from email, location-based information. And I just, the, the op-ed pointed this out, that it's interesting that they are making the case that government should have to have a search warrant to access that private information, but they are not making a case about what should the, be the limitations on the companies and their relative access to their, that, inf that private information for both adults and kids. So it's just, there are a lot of factors at play here. And I do want to make sure we and, get these last two. And I just want to circle back, because um, Baron said you made one of my points very eloquently. But I will reiterate that um, when the Federal Trade Commission passed its COPPA rule, we hewed very closely to the language of the COPPA statute, and um, with, with only very limited exceptions. To the extent that there would be a move afoot to expand COPPA, um, as Barron pointed out, some of those moves would require legislative change and wouldn't be um, able to be made at the regulatory level, at, at our agency level. And so there would be other bodies involved in making those changes. But at this point, um, kind of, I'll use you're going to laugh when I say this, but the sky is falling um, references um, are, are quite premature because we are just at the beginning of our review process. COPPA was last reviewed in 2005. At that point, we made only one minor change to the statute to, to make something permanent that had been uh, temporary previously. But the rapid fire pace of technological change and children's embrace of technology led the agency to believe that it was appropriate to accelerate our review and take another look at this point. It, the fact that we're looking doesn't necessarily mean that any outcome is predetermined. But to not look would be irresponsible. And just to be clear, I, I'm not criticizing the FTC at all for looking. I'm glad they are, and I'm, I, I look forward to seeing what comes out of it. I, I, but, but somebody also needs to point out that, you know, when we talk about the sky, the sky is, you know, what could happen in the future? What, what are the mm -hmm. potentials? And, and there is at least the potential now, if, if this thing, which is not in, in the FTC's hands, passes the Congress, uh, giving the FTC the power to make rules without specific grants of, of statutory authority, at some point in the future, we could have a very different conversation in which we're no longer talking about the COPPA statute, but we basically you know, are just talking about any sort of regulatory agency that gets to make whatever rules it wanted to. And again, I'm not suggesting that's what the FTC has in mind, because I think these two things have just intersected by a really unfortunate coincidence. But, but, but if that happens, it's going to make a lot of us very concerned about what might happen down the road, maybe at the next review of the, of the act, when, when some of us aren't here or, or, or involved in these issues. Let me open that up back up. Uh, Sandy Bear with Ridge Global. I'm actually interested in it beyond a policy uh, level. Uh, is the panel aware of any technology initiatives uh, uh, being taken on by industry to look at security on the device rather than security through, I mean, there's plenty of security online uh, technology that, that allows that. But you'd mentioned earlier, Amanda, that some of this is just the device rather than the internet. And if you're not using the internet, and certainly beyond parental control. I mean, how, how are these kids and these parents understanding uh, security options that they could take to, to prevent bad things from happening? Uh, as far as uh, I know, I don't know of anything that's looking at that or of necessarily either education campaigns or of necessarily even what kind of tools are available. So I, I assume parents are Not equally happening. ignorant. Yeah. When you say security on device, in other words, there's some software or something on each phone that could lock it down or to well, share it or something? Well, I mean, there's security online, right? Oh. So you can have um, scanners that c prevent malware or spyware, oh. that right. kind of oh. thing. And so I was. If, if you're not using the internet, it seems that some of that could transfer from the internet to your phone if, yeah. if in fact, you were using the internet. Now, but if you're just doing texting, you yeah. know, how do you keep um, some I, security levels out there? The, one of the weird things about the, the mobile phone or the cell phone space is that there's so many different types of handsets. Right. Uh, I, I visited uh, a Samsung one time, and they literally produce a new model each week. 
so, so there are literally thousands of different types of handsets. And that means that if you're a software operator or something like that, it's a, that's a huge, huge potential. <laughs> if I can put it that way. If I could just add here, I mean, as, as we mentioned, the, the concerns about uh, child safety and, and, and access to content are in some ways going to grow when kids have a, a more internet capable device. Yeah. And so I, I, I want to be clear that that will change this conversation, and raise a different set of concerns, but there's also a silver lining there, which is that the more capable the devices become, the more capable the, the uh, technological controls become too. And in fact, that problem that was just mentioned in a way become solved because you don't have to write for every uh, every phone. All you have to write for is the operating system. So I'm, I'm an Android user and I've spent a lot of time looking at the security uh, apps that are available for Android and they're actually pretty good. Mm -hmm. And I think what we're starting to see is the is the development of those tools. And I'm, I'm reasonably confident that in the next few years you will see the same sort of flowering of uh, parental control tools, security tools, and privacy management tools in that space being written for each of the, the five or six major mobile operating systems that you've seen in the desktop environment. And my, my, my hope is that those tools will, de will develop and, and, uh, and be there just at the time when more kids are starting to go online and use these things. And so in that way, technology will solve some of the problems, if not most of them, that it creates. Yeah, and just to expand on that just slightly, <clears throat> uh, Linda Crittle with the Safe Internet Alliance, but also a former mobile industry person. Um, the mobile industry is following the same trajectory as the PC industry, right. with a couple of exceptions. Really, in the PC world, you had Windows and you had Mac. And um, on the mobile phones, you have a whole different uh, plethora of operating systems. And so, to the questions about the multi-user interoperability, the games, the, the, the educational pieces and all, those come down to four factors that um, have to hit a sweet spot. And those are the phone capabilities itself, the battery life, the screen size, um, all of those kind of pieces, the cost, the cost of the phone, the cost of the plan, the cost of the applications you want to download. It comes to the um, interoperability across not only um, carriers, but also the platforms, whether it's GSM or, or a, um, a different type of, of uh, platform. And then it's the availability of the apps. And the apps will be developed when the rest of the sweet spots are coming into line, because that's when it's financially viable. But my question um, is really to Amanda and, uh, and um, on the research. Anecdotally, and multiple um, anecdotes do not make data, um, but anecdotally, um, I've seen a very, um, the, the watershed moment for boys appears to be when they get a girlfriend in terms of volume of text messaging going from relatively low to 100 uh, a day. And, and did you do any um, watershed type things? What, when did those change points happen? Do you have information if, if that's really true, that that's what's changing it, not just, I got my phone, I now got to an all-you-can-eat plan, but are there life events that are changing those data points? Um, well, in the data, we did ask whether or not you had a significant other or mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. um, and then only about 22% said they didn't, which seems a little, maybe people are just better, social, more social than I was back then. But, uh, or they sound like a loser to say no. Yeah, I think there's some of that going on. Um, but we don't know exactly where that falls in relationship to some of the numbers and the changes that we see. The only things we really have that are concrete in place are age changes and sort of date of, of getting the cell phone. But we don't even know necessarily when you got your unlimited plan. We're just looking kind of historically at the growth okay. and understanding the way that that tends to tends to ripple out. But I think there's a variety of effects going on. I, I mean, for boys, if it's, if it's the moment you get a significant other, that's, I think, an important part. But I think also there's just a natural ramping up at between 14 and 15. Um, for boys in particular, girls, it's a little bit younger yeah. um, that you can see. And, and that's around the time when you know, the opposite sex becomes <laughs> kind of a viable older, um, sort of a time sink, um, but uh, for boys at least. Uh, and I think there's, there's some of that going on as well. Well, but uh, we don't we don't have specific correlations on that. Okay. But Thank if I could just shoot something in there, oh, yeah. we, we did ask in the, one of the focus groups. It seems like there's a lot of misunderstanding going on in the texting. Uh, there's kind of a girl style and a guy style, yes. 
And there's a lot of space for misunderstanding one another. For example, we have one site where I think it was a girl who said, and, and he answered it, and he used a period at the end of the sentence. It was like, you know, what's going on? Why are you being so abrupt with me? Instead of, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. 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 Thank you know, you instead of friend. rounding it off with a smiley or something. You know, and so, yeah. But the guys were, you know, they, all these girly things, you know, you always have to talk for a long time, and it really gets old, you know. Why can't they just say yes or no? Yeah. Uh, you know. I mean, so, you know, moving things that have been, that are, you know, documented otherwise in sort of interpersonal communication face-to-face -face are now moving into this space of text messaging, and, and there's some of that, too. Though, again, boys are overall just less enthusiastic about text messaging and part of it has to do with this sense that there's a kind of a almost feminine experience there's sending a lot of texts and spending a lot of time texting is is, is, is coded feminine guys are like yeah you they want to be more instrumental about what they're doing yeah we're gonna figure out where we're going and then we're not gonna text anymore then we're done we weren't we're very good go. at sending thank you notes in my day either. right so, it's so it's, it's, it, yeah it's, a, it's sort of an extension of there's an extension of that as well more taciturn in general yeah. and it's it's an interesting point about kind of the way that this is a blending of technology and capacity but also child de development and, and all the different factors that go in here um, I want to close this one. We're going to start another panel after a brief break, looking more at the educational aspects of mobile. But I do want to thank everyone on our panel for the data and the insights.